So welcome to our Everything Marketplaces community workshop, which is going to be a marketplace expansion today. So I'm really excited to have our community entrepreneur in residence or EIR, Danny Martinez, join us in leading the workshop. So many of you probably know Danny from his awesome deep dive posts and working with him in the community. But if not, he has some really great marketplace experience previously at Airbnb and eBay. So Danny is going to be leading our workshop today where we'll be covering marketplace expansion and starting off with the basics. So thinking through, you know, when is the right time to think about expansion? Some of the specific considerations we will be walking through high level examples of expansion playbooks, actionable tips that you can use and more. So as a quick note on the uh, format, our workshops are 20 to 25 minute presentations followed by a group Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the workshop, you can post them in the uh, Zoom chat and then just be sure to turn on your camera and use the uh, Zoom raise hand functionality. Uh, you know, right before we get to the uh, group Q&A, so that way we can uh, call on you. And that'll be around the uh, 20 to 25 minute mark. So with that said, thanks again for uh, joining us here today, Danny. And, uh, you know, really excited for the workshop. And I'll actually just uh, let you start off with a uh, brief intro and uh, take it from here. Perfect. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks for the, the, uh, the, the intro, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Danny Martinez. Uh, some of you might have come across me um, already on the community, but for those that haven't, um, really looking forward to connecting and having some good discussions um, on, on this workshop. Um, so a quick kind of brief about my background. Um, so I was previously at eBay and Airbnb um, amongst some other marketplaces in kind of growth analytics and operations roles. Um, I've been a marketplace geek uh, for pretty much my, my whole professional life, uh, which is what's led me to, to working with Mike and everything marketplaces as a community EIR. Um, so today, um, we're going to be talking about marketplace expansion. Um, and for this presentation, I want to make it clear that these are learnings both from my own experiences, um, as well as, as those from, from the community. Um, it's, I think it's the beauty of everything marketplaces is kind of our collective, um, experiences and insights. So I'm really looking forward to sharing those with, with you today. I know I've definitely found, found it useful when I've got a question, I'm like, ah, oh, Surely some other marketplace person has encountered this before, and thankfully they found it on on, on the community. Um, and then a, a small caveat: so this advice um, won't naturally translate over to, to everyone, but we've covered a diverse set of marketplaces here in some of the case studies. Um, so you should find some examples that are are relevant to to, to your own your own marketplace startups. Um, so with that, I'll kick it off. And let's get started. So in terms of agenda, um, here's, here's what we're going to be covering today. Um, so we'll get started with the basics uh, around establishing whether you're ready for expansion um, and then how to set yourself up for success during that expansion. Um, and this is kind of intended mostly for marketplaces with local considerations like Uber Eats and Airbnb, et cetera. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have some time for Q&A um, towards the end, so happy to to cover any questions then. So let's get started with uh, with the basics. Um, so in considering whether you're ready for geo expansion, um, it's good to think about um, product market fit. You want to study the local market um, and then decide whether you have the resources for um, expansion. So just briefly before I get into the next slide, um, you might be asking why product market fit is important when considering ge geo expansion um, or international expansion. Isn't that a um, completely, completely different topic? Um, but in fact, it's actually really connected. Um, if you don't have product market fit already, um, you're simply going to kind of spend money acquiring customers in a, in a different country that are unlikely to find your product appealing, um, much less stick around to use it. Um, so we'll get into more detail around what we mean by product market fit in, in the next slide. So you might have seen a variation of the chart on the left before. Um, you essentially want your customers to be sticking around over a long period of time. You want these, these retention curves to be flattening out over time. Um, and that's a sign that your users are getting enough value um, out of your product um, to come back to it repeatedly. Um, but marketplaces, as, as you guys will probably know, are much more complex than just activity curves. You also need to consider um, additional things like liquidity ratios, um, how balanced is your marketplace, um, and are all sides getting getting value from it. A slight caveat here is um, retention curves and liquidity ratios are highly specific to your marketplace. Um, 
But having said that, there there are good sources to check out if you want to look at benchmarks um, for um, specific B two B companies or consumer, etc. Um, we'll put we'll put those in the um, in in the appendix, um, so you can you can check those out after after the presentation is is done. So you've established that you've got product market fit. Now what? Um, basically, you want to spend a lot of time studying the local market. When I say market here, um, that's slightly going to mean different things for the different marketplaces. Uh, for some, it might be a city. For example, LA is a market for Airbnb, um, but it might also be a neighborhood. For example, Santa Monica is a neighborhood for Uber Eats. We don't have um, quite enough time to cover it in this presentation, but you'll also want to check out some very tactical resources uh, that are available on everything marketplaces to help you decide which markets to go after. Um, I that when I was talking about some of the like oh I wish I, I knew uh, of a resource and then I came to the the, the community to find it. Uh, this is one example that came up and I was helping a company um, choose their their kind of top top five to ten markets and there's there's like a very good um, methodology and, and use case that you can find. Um, so I've listed out some of the things that you want to do to study uh, your market on this slide. Um, you, you'll essentially um, want, want, want to understand the likelihood of your product being successful and the ecosystem it's going to be a part of um, and how many adjustments you need to make ahead of a, of a successful launch. So some of the things um, that I've listed out on this slide are the things that you want to be thinking about. And on this slide, I, I mentioned we're going to have um, quite a few uh, case studies. Um, on, on this slide, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of high profile example of what can happen when you don't study the local market. Um, in this case, we'll, we'll be talking about Uber Eats specifically. So um, with Uber Eats, they expanded into Korea thinking that they could kind of copy paste the model that had worked for them in, in, in their other markets. Um, and ultimately they found out the hard way that their product wasn't really built for their preferred local practices. And um, so whilst I'm imagining most people on the call um, are in the US, I'm in, in the UK, um, whilst Uber Eats in, in those uh, geographies uh, works on kind of um, individual deliveries, in Korea, there's actually the concept of a, a batch delivery. Um, and this isn't something that Uber Eats was, was built for. Um, and it eventually meant that it couldn't really compete with the local players and they had to eventually exit the market as, as a result. Um, which is a pretty expensive endeavor when you think about kind of the time, the effort uh, required to launch a market. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a pretty pretty painful thing to have to endure. Um, which actually takes me on to the next slide. So too often it can be super exciting to talk about new markets. I uh, I think every entrepreneur dreams of the day that their product goes global and. I have enough people uh, hitting up my inbox being like, oh, we want to expand internationally. Um, but as always with startups, uh, focus is the name of the game. You should really ask yourself whether now is the right time, whether you're going to be able to dedicate the time, the, the resources required for expansion, and whether it's 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 really a you know, top priority for, for your company. Um, these are just some of the questions that you should uh, ask yourself ahead of kind of truly committing to an expansion plan. You have the time, how fast you want to go with the current tools and processes, um, et cetera, et cetera. So a great example of this previous point is uh, Young Ones, a company I did some consulting for last year. So I was actually brought on at the point that the company had already decided to pursue expansion um, into the UK, uh, the UK market. Um, and I think the, the the brief at the time was like, right, so we've, we've kind of expanded into this market and it's kind of not working and we're not really sure why. Um, and when I when I went in and kind of evaluated kind of their setup, um, one of my first recommendations to the team was like, actually, you're really, really understaffed um, in order to make success, this successful. Um, but over time, we, we set up kind of the, the right team, the right tool, the right processes. Um, which meant that that was no longer a consideration um, uh, as to whether the, the market was going to be successful or not. But the team essentially spent a lot of time, time at the beginning of their expansion efforts wondering whether it was that the product wasn't the right fit or whether the setup wasn't the right one. Um, and ultimately, um, I, I'm happy to, to report that it was, it, was, it was the latter, that the setup wasn't really the, the right one. Um, 
after you know the team was staffed accordingly um the team in the uk is actually doing really well now they have a great team in place um and they're, they're, they're well staffed and have the resources that they need to make expansion a success um but that definitely wasn't the case on day one and it required a bit of hand holding to say right it's, it's okay to invest before um before you 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 have complete certainty at least then then you will know whether it's a pro market fit issue or, or it's a resource issue let's move on to the more tactical things so you've decided that you want to prioritize expansion and you committed to it and you've decided to stuff it up accordingly um what, what does that actually look like um in these next slides we're going to cover things like the team that you want in place the functions um and the channels that you want to consider in, in your expansion efforts so this will be different for your own team and product um but generally rule of thumb that you want to follow is as a founder is that you should be as involved as possible for your first expansion markets um whilst the playbook is still being defined uh you want to hire a local expert that can help you to navigate that market but you as the founder can bring insights around uh, the company and, and the market itself and uh, the, the the space in which the company is operating in. um once you have a clear playbook defined um, and it's worked in a few markets. That's when you kind of deploy relevant teams from HQ um, in order to get your, your new hires up to speed. Um, but at that point, it's more of a, an execution play rather than a strategic one. Um, in terms of the goals for that playbook that you outline, you essentially want to confirm uh, whether you have a viable product in this geography as soon as possible. Um, going back to my previous example, that was a question that um, Young Ones was, was was trying to answer um, quite, quite early on. Um, is, is uh, has it not worked so far because we don't have the product market fit um, in this country, um, and that's something that you'll want to get an answer to in in a, a defined period of time, kind of as soon as possible, so you know whether it's a, a market you want to double down on or or one that you you abandon. So from the previous slide, you might, might be asking, okay, well, who who should we hire specifically? Um, the reality is, it it really depends. Um, DoorDash is, is a, a case study that we cover in this on this slide, um, where and figuring out the nuances um, for your product um, requires kind of um, a team to go in and figure out okay what's the local knowledge and in person interactions that are going to be required, and that's a task in itself. So rather than just saying okay just hire a salesperson, leave it at that. Um, DoorDash in this example also hired local people to work on things like merchant services, logistics, and um, areas that they, they, they deem would benefit from having in-person interactions. Now, um, I'm not saying that you as a startup will have all the resources to go in and hire all these people from day one, but at least going through that kind of exercise of deciding, right, here's all the hires that we would um, ideally make if we if we had the resources. Um, and then it becomes a kind of a prioritization game to say, right, these, uh, if, if we have these, these kind of three, four roles, these are the most important ones that we, we want to prioritize. In terms of functions to involve, so if the previous slide was about who you should hire, this slide is about who you should involve from your current team. So a good question to, to kind of figure this out for your own marketplace is, where are the most crucial touch points with your customers? So as a rule of thumb, um, your creatives, um, your creative teams will require in-person interactions. Um, and these are the ones that you want to hire locally. Um, and the individuals that want to can and kind of help to optimize um, existing channels or that are kind of uh, heavily technical uh, teams like products like data or, or channel specific experts um, will be the ones that you want to you want to have in he um, in headquarters and this is something that I've seen across um, my, my, my multiple experiences at companies like Airbnb and eBay that's generally kind of the the way that, that they would um, they would uh, hire in local markets versus in, in headquarters. So Matt from House made a, a great point here. A common hurdle for companies is that they forget to start up their existing team um, in order to deal with expansion. So it's, it, it can be quite easy to think, right, I'm going to hire this uh, team um, you know, remotely um, and they're going to make make it uh, growth uh, go up up into the right um, and that's how it's going to work. Um, but the reality is it's, it's hardly ever like that. I could talk for days about my experience uh, at Airbnb and feeling like the local teams didn't have the right supports, the support from the relevant teams in the US. Um, but yeah, I won't bore you with those details. What I can say is 
that over time the company got a lot better at stuff stuffing up these functions um but uh, as matt says uh here it's, it's a lesson that most companies um learn the hard way and um, so, so yeah it's just something to, to keep in mind so on to specific channels um so which ones should you deploy in your launch market um so it's tempting to assume that you can simply copy the channels that worked well for you in your main markets um but ignoring competitive local dynamics uh, can be a pretty expensive mistake for example let's say in your main market you don't have a lot of competition so buying up adwords is probably going to have a great roi um but then you land in another market with steep competition it's likely to be the case that these competitors have already your competitors have already exhausted this channel so buying up adwords is probably not going to offer a great return um and this is actually a pretty common mistake that i've observed um, I think it comes down to kind of familiarity. So when companies are already familiar with a specific channel and they've seen them be successful before, um, it's easy to kind of default to thinking, right, these are the ones that we're, we're going to pursue. Um, but in practice, this this is, this could be leading you down the wrong path. And you may want to consider channels that you, you haven't tried before. It's going to be scarier and you won't be an expert on, on day one, but there's always kind of the, the option of hiring an agency or hiring a contractor whilst you're trying to figure that out. Um, but before you even consider spending money on ads, you want to make sure that you've kind of adjusted the product and the UX uh, to serve the, the local market. Small local differences can actually have a pretty big impact. Um, so for example, if your launch market has a different language, um, you probably won't want to bother spending money until you've localized those pages uh, that you're going to be directing that traffic to. Um, one very basic example I remember from my time uh, consulting with a with marketplace was, was kind of seeing uh, a strange way of displaying numbers um, on their homepage. So rather than um, showing a 10.5%, they'd show a 10.5% in the landing page copy. Um, now that's pretty common um, in, in in some countries um, across across Europe. Um, but here in the UK, it's like, wait, 10.5, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, to a UK audience landing on that page, that's going to look really confusing. Um, and if you actually think about the, the the journey that customers go through when discovering a new service um there's a lot of like is this legit or is is this like is this scam is that actually going to work so you want to be um avoiding any of those trust issues um and so localizing is, is something that you definitely be doing um before deploying ad dollars um i'd also say generally uh having an open mind um, when it comes to these channels is really important you want to experiment with different ones um and I think you would generally be surprised by, by what works. I'll talk about a, a very personal example um, in a couple of slides of um, how skeptical I, I was about a particular channel, um, how, how wrong I ultimately ended up, ended up being. So in, in this example, Dan Orkin from, from Reba talks about how they learned the importance of localization. So unless you fix the basics, you're not going to get the kind of similar conversion rates. Um, is, is kind of the key insight to take away from this. Um, and it's ultimately going to have an impact on your unit economics um, and as a result, the viability of your launch market overall. Um, so walk before you run is the analogy that I like to use here. Um, get the basics sorted out before you spend too much money on, on paid channels. So I previously spoke about not being afraid to experiment and to test your own biases and assumptions. Um, so many years ago, Airbnb decided to float a house on the River Thames in London. And I remember like hearing about this and was like, right, skeptic in me was very confident that this wouldn't work. Like brand marketing is just really hard to measure. Um, you know, Airbnb wasn't really a household name. Why would people pay attention to a floating house uh, with an American brand company logo on it? Um, and actually, it went on to become one of the most uh, successful local marketing campaigns the company ran in the UK. So that's how much I know about uh, brand marketing. Um, but it's, it's a great example of how not being afraid to experiment with different channels resulted in a great outcome. Um, and that's something that MEB was was known for being quite bold and saying, right, we're going to try the thing. It hasn't worked before, but uh, we're just going to go go and, and, and try and, and experiment with it. Um, so, so it's an example of how not being afraid to experiment um, can can result in really, really great results. So in these next slides, we'll get into more kind of tactical things that we've seen work across different marketplaces. And um, again, good to remember, these are some of the things we've seen work. 
Um, but there are, as always, kind of context, context and nuance really matters. Um, so strategies and playbooks aren't something that we're going to get into uh, for this presentation. We'll simply run out of time, uh, but we'll link some relevant materials in, in the appendix feed to check out. So we previously talked about which functions to hire. Um, in these next slides, we'll talk about what kind of profiles to hire and how to set them up to success. Um, and also how to ensure that they feel well connected to the existing to your existing team um, rather than being silent away. One of the kind of common uh, themes and issues to, to watch out for is um, you'll you'll want to avoid ever having a kind of an us versus them mentality with your local teams and your teams in, in HQ. And so that's that's just something to to be aware of in terms of um, making sure that you set up the the the, the onboarding processes to, to avoid this. Um, we'll also talk about how to define and measure clear goals. And um, it's all important when when evaluating a new hire or a new team in, in the launch market. So in terms of the types of profiles, one thing that I really like to do when um, evaluating candidates for local roles is um, kind of answering the question, can they teach me something about the market that I didn't really know already, um, which is readily available on Google? And it's when you're interviewing candidates in this scenario, it's, like it's really clear when someone really knows their market. And it's like, right, either I've been living here my whole life or you know, I've spent a lot of time kind of, uh, in, 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 in this place. Um, and it's clear when you know, somebody's just trying to uh, you know, regurgitate the thing that they've, they've seen on Google. Um, so that, that's definitely one thing that you, you want to consider. Um, another thing to consider is actually the seniority. Um, you will eventually want, if, if the market does well, you want this person to kind of hire and expand the local team um, and to be able to execute without too much handholding. So that's probably not something that you want for like a, a, a new grad. Um, and so seniority is definitely something to, um, to consider in, in these conversations. Um, and once you've made that hire during the onboarding process, making sure that the new hire gets a good amount of time to learn about the company, get the context that they need, um, and to maximize their chances of being successful in any role, it's it's often something that it's an investment that pays pays for itself in in the long term. So Pete Hancock, who was previously VP of Sales at Yelp, provides some some great insight here. Um, you don't want to over-index on experience. Um, you want to focus on hiring those that will do kind of whatever it takes to make the new market successful. It usually means someone with an entrepreneurial and a scrappy mindset. Um, but of course, there's balance. Um, to the point of the previous slide, you want to hire someone who has a bit of both, so both the scrappy and the entrepreneurial um, uh, mindset, but has that uh, and ability to eventually hire and, and grow a team as well. So one tactic that I've seen work well with work well multiple times is to send talent from your headquarters um, to help onboard your new local hires. Um, this is a great experience, not only for the new hire, you know, they have a teammate to talk to on day one. There's a bit of that camaraderie with them. You know, starting new roles is always scary, so having someone to talk to is, is always great. But also for your existing employee, um, it's an opportunity for them to travel. And it's also acknowledgement that if they have the company DNA that you, you want to instill on these new hires. So it's also an opportunity to give them a bit, bit of that recognition. Um, and what you want to do is get these kind of two individuals or these two teams to to to, to work together um, on 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 a kind of an onboarding project or some kind of initial project that gets them to actually do real stuff. Um, but also, it's important to get the kind of existing members to introduce your company culture. Um, this is especially important for for remote offices that there could be. We had a really great culture that was like instilled into us from from very early on. Um, it might be tempting to you know, want to get straight down to business and targets and get, get the person executing um, straight away. Um, but I, I kind of like to think about this as going slow in order to go fast. You know, front, front loading a great onboarding experience is going to give you, um, going to give you great results in, in the long term. So Steve, uh, who was previously at DoorDash, makes, makes a great point here. Um, there's, there's only so far that you can get with documents and with remote calls. Um, and you'll want existing team members on the ground to kind of share cultures and, and ways of working. I think if, if with that uh, being from the pandemic years, it's the, the, there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue and um, being in person is, is it's very hard to kind of replicate. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something to keep in mind. 
So when setting goals for your kind of new local hires and market, some common mistakes to be aware of. Um, I think the first one is over-indexing on current benchmarks from HQ. Remember, this is a new market with different dynamics. Don't assume that the same rules will apply in your new market. And too often I hear startups saying things like, you know, in our home market, it took three months to get the liquidity. Okay, that's that's a useful data point, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is it's just a data point. Assuming that it's going to be the same in the new market doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Um, it's safe to assume that uh, it's going to actually take longer with a new individual and a new team in place. Um, the second one is not getting buy-in goals, making sure that your new hire is energized by their goals and shows that they're the right balance between ambitious and realistic. The last thing you want is for them to be unmotivated with goals that don't feel attainable to them. One thing that I've done in the past is to run a session with the person who's ultimately going to be accountable for specific goals and get them to provide a bottom-up view of what they feel is realistic and ambitious. Um, this gives you a chance to like provide your own perspective and reasoning and enables more of a conversation rather than just kind of a top-down instruction, here's your goal and, and, and go, go, go ahead. Um, I think the third one is don't be afraid to reset your goals so they don't feel right. Um, uh, this is especially important in, in the early days where you're still kind of figuring it out. Remembering that kind of these goals are in service of, of an end end destination. And if you realize that they've never made sense, then you, you can adjust them as you go. Um, so, so yeah, that's um, remembering that, that you know, your advantage, um, that there's an advantage in being able to pivot quickly is, is an important thing. In terms of like tactical advice um, for, for setting goals, um, I think the first one is make sure you account for seasonality. Too often our teams, I've seen teams set month one goals irrespective of this, um, which leads to a lot of wheel spinning. If you launch in your peak month um, uh, or if you launch in kind of your lowest activity month, you, you need to expect different results of those two outcomes. Um, making sure that you can get quick, well, quick feedback as to whether things are working or not. So having clear input metrics, which allows you to evaluate how the camera is doing as opposed to simply what uh, revenue they're generating, which can have a bit of a, a lag. Um, and for marketplaces, it's, it's really crucial that you need enough time for marketplace liquidity, which you know, we discussed in a previous slide. Getting that flywheel spinning is not for review, so it's something you you want to make sure to, to leave good time for. With, with marketplace liquidity being so important, um, you also want to constrain your initial target market. Uber Eats is a really good example of this. Um, so getting to liquidity, uh, as I mentioned, is key to any marketplace. Um, in the case of Uber, they kind of did this by focusing on specific neighborhoods rather than going for a city straight away. Um, so this gave them the all important focus to eventually win a city, but um, gave them that focus to go kind of neighborhood by neighborhood um, and ultimately led to, led to their success. In these kind of remaining slides, we're going to cover some other considerations you want to keep in mind, product support and legal functions. And we'll also cover how you want to approach risk and uncertainty with, with new launches. So one thing you'll need to be really comfortable with um, is that new markets bring new risks. Um, you'll need to be comfortable with, with that. Um, as, as, as easy as it sounds to say, it's, it's really easy in, in practice. But looking at it from a different angle, it's also your advantage as a startup. Um, you can take way bigger risk um, than your your incumbents can, um, and it's it's also a competitive advantage if you think about it that way. Um, a useful exercise to figure out kind of what is the worst uh, case scenario and work backwards from that when 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 kind of being comfortable, getting comfortable with risk. Um, and of course, this is something that needs to be um, you need to evaluate your approach to risk over time. Um, you'll eventually get to a stage where if you're big enough, you'll need to find a balance um, between kind of uh, you know, pirate and navy, uh, as, as Reid Hoffman likes to describe it. Um, in this next slide, I'll talk about kind of a very uh, specific example from, from Airbnb. So when Airbnb launched in London, there was actually a law which only allowed people to rent their homes to tourists for 90 days a year. Um, now, did it make sense for Airbnb to be compliant with this rule on day one? Absolutely not. They're too small for anyone to pay attention, and really nobody nobody was going to give them a hard time. Um, but in 2016, um, this had actually reached its breaking point. Uh, local politicians were actively talking about uh, the effect of Airbnb in London, the papers, on TV, um, and the news, and eventually it made business sense to comply with these laws in spite of the impact it would have on revenue. Um, as the local GM kind of put it at the time, I'd rather sacrifice some revenue now then lose the whole business in a couple of years. And I think 
not not hard to think about uh, some examples of market places that have, have faced uh, faced those conundrums um, when when they're kind of go, going too far on the, uh, the the pirate end of the spectrum. So here I'd like to introduce the concept of the minimum bookable product. So when launching, you want to think about what's the least amount of tweaks you can make to your product so it's actually useful to your local users. And you usually want to figure this out by speaking to customers, running user research, um, and understanding the customer's needs. Um, during this process, you maybe discover there's part of your pro uh, parts of your product that don't actually make sense um, for your new market and which you probably want to want to remove um, before launching. Um, and here's an example from Rob Chan, who was previously at Uber. When they launched in Japan, they figured out their kind of standardized uh, driver onboarding process didn't make a lot of sense. Um, in Japan, there's no such thing as a, uh, as a background check for drivers. So essentially, the, the process the driver needs to go through is going to a court and asking a judge to write a letter instead. Um, so this is exactly an example of something that they could remove from, from their product to make sure that it made, made the most sense for their local drivers. Um, but actually, when you think about it, um, if I'm if I'm a, a new driver and I'm, I'm I'm going through this onboarding process, and I'm seeing something that isn't rele relevant to my local market. That's probably an example where there's there's a bit of a trust issue of like, ah, is this, is this legit? Have they actually thought about this? Um, so yeah, so it's a good example of um, figuring out the, the the local context. How about from a support perspective? Um, so what do you need on day one? Um, at a minimum, you want agents that are kind of in the same time zone, they're fluent in the local language. Um, rather than outsourcing straight away, you're likely want to hire an in-house team for, for these efforts first. Um, but once you have something that works, you can consider outsourcing to, to relevant vendors that, that can help you scale quickly. Um, so the previously mentioned approach is one that both Uber and Airbnb took when expanding um, geographically. Um, so an example from, from Rob Chan here, uh, it's him talking about kind of Uber offshoring to, to drive scale. Um, and in the case of Airbnb, they worked with a company called Voxper that had the agents um, from all over the world that allowed for support to scale um, with kind of the peak and low seasons um, for, for, for their customers. The final thing that we'll discuss in this presentation is kind of legal matters. Um, so some of the basics of finding and vetting lawyers um, include focusing on those that have Marketplace experience already, they can kind of raise flags for you um, in, in your new market. Ideally, you'll want word of mouth recommendations and references. Um, you know, needless to say, get, uh, getting the wrong words could be an expensive mistake to make. So it's one you'll, you'll want to be quite careful with. Um, some non negotiables to kind of get started in a market. Um, you want to have uh, enforceable terms of use and a compliant privacy policy. Um, if you're hiring in another country, making sure you have the relevant NDA, employment, and and contractor agreements are kind of um, things that you'll you'll want to get get set up for um, just to get started. Um, but again, it's important to kind of consider the balance between risk and reward. Um, Jeremy, who's a startup lawyer um, and founder of Marketplace Risk, gives an insightful quote here, um, kind of reminding founders to adjust their approach based on kind of which which industry they're operating in. For an unregulated industry probably don't want to ask for permission, you can probably ask for, for forgiveness later. But if you're in a regulated industry, you'll want to adjust your approach. Um, you know, future licenses or permissions um, might be at stake. So maybe you want to be a bit more, more careful in those cases. Um, with that, we can go to q and I can see there are some questions in the chat. Great uh, presentation. So thanks for uh, walking us through, Danny. Definitely a lot, a lot we can uh, we can cover and kind of get into here. So, hey, I actually had a, a question for you, and, I, and we can um, maybe uh, take this uh, or relate it to earlier stage marketplaces and, uh, of course, local marketplaces. But what would you say, like, m maybe like uh, one to three kind of like of the biggest mistakes uh, or are you seeing that founders and teams are making right now at the earlier stages? Underestimating uh, how hard it's going to be. Um, so thinking that, right, um, I'm going to be able to uh, just hire someone, hire an individual, they can uh, get started and, and be able to go straight away um, and kind of under uh, under resourcing um, their, their team is something that I, I think I encounter quite a lot. The other one is kind of underestimating um, how much localization is going to be important. Um, you know, it's easy to, to think, that, okay, um, you know, we're going to open this new market and everybody's going to think like us. Um, everybody's going to speak like us and you know, the same thing is going to be important, but actually it's really important to drill down into 
um, the local um, considerations and local use cases and making sure the product is localized is, is really important. Um, that's the, the second one that comes to mind. Um, and then I think uh, the, 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 the third one that, that um, is, is probably also uh, relevant here is, yeah, the, the, the assumption that the things that have, have worked in the home market are exact, going to be exactly the, the, the things that are going to work in, in the new market. So I talked to the example of channels um, in, 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 this, in the deck, um, but it's also kind of the processes, the, the tools, the, the same kind of profile. It, it's, it's assuming that you know, there's going to be a certain homogeneity between markets um, is, is, um, is, is the third one that comes to mind. That was going to be helpful. Definitely, I made a few of those mistakes myself in the past. So. Cool. Hey, uh, Evelyn, I saw you raise your hand. Do you, uh, do you want to come on? Nice meeting you, Danny. In the earlier deck, you talked a lot about product market fit. So having worked at Uber in the past, I know like product market fit in US, it's very apparent. They are daily active user, monthly active user. But in Japan, actually, Eats have more product market fit first before right. So I'm curious, how do you spot the product market fit in different countries and cultures giving different stage of the product in that particular country? Yeah. So I think um going back to to, to some of the 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 just the things that I was sharing on, on that product market fit slide. Um you essentially want to be looking at the the classic thing is like the retention curves. Like how are the retention curves flattening out? Now that's the, the frustrating thing with that is depending on your business, you might need to wait a while before you kind of have enough data to, to look at those retention curves. So I think in, in, in the very early days, it's kind of, it's, it, it will be a combination of um, looking at the data, but also just speaking to your customers um, and figuring out through user research, are they actually getting the value that um, we think we can provide? Are they getting to the aha moment? Um, are, are they getting the value that we can provide uh, users in our, our home our home market where we already ideally have a product market fit? I'd say it's a combination of, of those two things. It's uh, kind of analytical and the data part, but it's also the um, the uh, kind of speaking to customers and making sure that as as they use your product, you're, you're understanding whether um, they're 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 getting value out of it. At that stage, would you ask how much are you willing to pay for our product? Or is it simply just like, would you consider using our product? If so, how frequent? Yeah, so I actually, I'm, 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 I'm a fan of rather than asking, would you pay for our product? Um, I'm a fan of like actually getting some, some firm commitment. So there's things that you can do um, to test kind of people's willingness. You can do things like wait lists. Um, you can do things like get them to sign up um, for like a, a, a beta version. Um, get getting something because usually when you when you have people in the user research context and you tell them will you be willing to pay for my product there's like a human psychology thing there right they'll, they'll want to please you and they'll want to be nice and so yeah sure i'll pay for your product but you actually want to go a bit further so um i i would look for signals um from actual real users uh, of like are they actually using the product in the same way as 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 we as we expect from from users that have pro market fit in our in our, in our home uh, um, market, um, so yeah, I uh, in those user research interviews, it would be more asking people that are already using the product, already paying for the products, kind of how how they found it, are they getting the right value from it, um, what their frustrations are with it, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Hey, uh, Danny, I actually had a question for you. Someone um, uh, posted in the community in advance, and it was and it's somewhat related to Evelyn's question, which you know, might be, you know, a marketplace that kind of has like, you know, like a multi kind of like product offering, or you're thinking about like, hey, you know, we're a local marketplace, and we're looking to expand into a new market, but yet we have like multiple categories. Um, have you seen or like, maybe do you have any like best practices when it comes to that of saying like, you know, we're a marketplace, for instance, for local services, and we're expanding into a new market, like, as far as when it comes to the categories, you know, do you like, is it kind of best practice to launch all categories and then narrow in? Or how do you kind of think about that and advise earlier stage, uh, you know, founders to think through it? My, my personal preference is to keep a launch, you know, going back to kind of the concept of um, a minimum bookable product is, is to like launch the smallest thing that you possibly can. Um, if you think about when you're being introduced to a new category, if you're unfamiliar with the brand, um, 
like that's going to be like a whole like okay wait what is this what is it that you guys do like is it is it product one is it product two um so I, the way i like to think about it is like launch establish the core product um or establish the product that you want to launch but launching that kind of in a sequential phase i think makes more sense um if you think about like a an, uh, an airbnb for example um uh, i know that um when we did uh the uh, experiences uh, launches, um, for example, it would be kind of a, a market by market uh, approach rather than saying, okay, people are already familiar with the brand. Let's just do experiences everywhere because it's like there's there's learnings that you'll get from from each and every launch, um, which can, can kind of compound over time. So yeah, that that's usually I I'd usually recommend more of a sequential approach rather than that. Uh, launch everything approach yeah no, that's gonna be super helpful so i definitely and i know it's a nuance as well so i asked it for for someone but i i felt like uh we could we could probably talk about that for about 30 minutes sharing uh sharing stories about it ourselves so hey uh hey i'm all joe i want to come on i saw you raise your hand yeah quick question um and i'm asking this because i've sort of been in this position before but how do you deal how do you balance between um i mean this is the obvious eternal question supply and demand right but if you're trying to open a new market or open something unusual how do you balance between limited area or limited geography or limited reach or limited products with the network effects that are necessary to truly show that you've got something going? Um, and I can sort of give you an example of like of what I'm doing, but but as if as as a broader question, I think that would just be an interesting one if you have a, a broader view on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the way in which we 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 did this. Uh, the, the example that comes to mind is with, with the young ones. So whenever we go to do a launch, um, it can be fairly overwhelming, right? Do you get the supply side first? Do you get the demand side first? Do you like optimize matches? I think ultimately what we landed at and what, what ended up working quite well was saying, right, um, we let's focus on um, on the, getting the supply, uh, the supply side, uh, the, the demand side first, sorry. And then once we've guaranteed that demand side, um, then it becomes quite possible for us to go out and find the, the specific supply. Um, so in, in a sense, you're kind of playing that matchmaker role at the beginning um, where you focus on one specific side um, and then you go off and make the matches and it becomes much easier for you to, rather than yeah, when you launch, you have that kind of cold start problem. If you just focus on acquiring supply and they have no demand, then they're going to go away, right? They you don't have any reason to say. And same for vice versa. Whereas if you go to one side and like, actually, look, we already have um, this demand waiting for you here, paying customers ready to ready to go, then that is something that can get that flywheel started. Um, and usually at the beginning, it, it's something that requires you to be the intermediary, basically. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how we've done, how I've done it with, with previous companies. Hey, uh, Carlos, do you, uh, do you want to jump on? I want to make sure we can, uh, we've got a few more minutes here, so I want to make sure we can uh, get you in. How do you think about, um, and how much time do you spend in entering and deciding what market to penetrate? Is it more of kind of looking at a competitive landscape? So just trying to get a sense of when we make our next move, how much research do we have to do before entering there? I think the. It, it can be like a, a bit of an over, overwhelming thing, especially if you're like quite analytical and, and data driven. You can, there's so many data points that you could look at that it like becomes, it, it can become like a really like daunting task of like, oh gosh, trying to gather all of these data points for all these markets. Like how, how do we do it? I, I generally, my preferred approach, and um, there's there's actually when we share the um, the presentation, there's, there's a link in the appendix to a great resource uh, from the Everything Marketplaces uh, community. Um, generally, the way that I like to think about this is select three to five really important metrics um, that you care about and that you can kind of gather that you, uh, data easily about for your chosen markets and then decide how, how you want to weight each of those um, three to five metrics. At the end, that's going to give you um, a set list. Now, for me, there's always like a bit of an art and a science here because whenever I've gone and done these, uh, these uh, exercises myself, you're kind of always in the back of your mind. You kind of know which ones you think you're like are going to be at the top. Um, and it's a good exercise to go through. If they're not at the top, you're like, okay, cool. Let, let me confirm my biases. There's something either wrong with the weighting that I've applied, with the metrics that I've chosen, or is it actually maybe just genuinely that um, this market doesn't make sense and I've got some inherent bias that's um, 
that's that's guiding my my decision making framework. So generally, um, I like uh, I like to keep it kind of time boxed and say, right, I'm going to spend a week doing this. Um, you know, gather the data points, decide the metrics, decide the weighting, do the analysis, um, and yeah, it, it's one that you you could spend um, months on, but it's probably not going to be useful to you. So select those three to five metrics, select the weighting that you want at the end, come up with with a list and. You know, don't also, uh, w- one piece of advice I'd give there is don't be afraid to, like, if there isn't a market on there, but you truly believe that you should be on there. Um, you know, like I said, it's a bit art and a bit science. So you, you want to find them, um, find a, a balance between the two. Yeah, I'll just uh, jump in here. I wanted to mention it, Carlos. Um, that's a, a really great question. So as far as like when it comes to the market selection, as uh, Danny mentioned, you know, identifying the metrics and then kind of creating that, you know, spreadsheet to evaluate from the markets, there's a really good uh, resource in the community uh, that's been shared. And it's actually like a template. And we have some steps that uh, that kind of, um, you know, help, help you make it easy to uh, take it and, uh, you know, apply it to your marketplace. So we'll include a uh, link in the recap post of that. So that way we can chat through that in more detail. So. Hey, hey, Ron, I saw you raise your hand and, uh, you know, you, you were on since the beginning. So we'll make sure we can uh, try to squeeze squeeze this one last question in. So, Hey, Danny, great presentation, Mike. Thanks for putting this together. Uh, quick question, Danny. How much, and I know this is going to vary from case to case, but what's a realistic time frame that you begin to map this out um, and, um, you know, that, that you intend on the market launch process for like a local city? Well, we think in terms of, you know, right now we're working on part of Orlando and uh, how much time do you plan in advance and what's realistic as far as, you know, how, wh- at what stage do you say, okay, this market is launched and you move it into a more mature mode? So Yeah, so typically um, what I've seen, like, obviously this is like going to be highly nuanced and depending on like how much resources you have, the kit, et cetera. Typically, what I've seen with the marketplaces that I've, I've worked with is um, anything from kind of three to six months um, is is the period that comes to mind. Um, but that's assuming that you've already hired the, the relevant people and that, you know, the product is in, is in a place where it's ready to go. Um, those three to six months are essentially uh, giving you that time to really figure out, can you get to kind of a, a low product market fit? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a broad answer, but yeah, based on, based on the examples, that I've seen where okay, the person is hired, the product is is kind of ready to go, and the the, the, the initial user research has been done. From the moment that you know your your local team you, you kind of hit go and and, and the uh, goals start um, moving, I think it's anything from like a three to six month uh, period. That was a great last question. So thanks, Ron. Thanks, thanks, Danny. So Danny, yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time to walk through the uh, workshop. This is, uh, you know, incredibly helpful. And I know it was a lo- lot of information, uh, you know, p- packed into a presentation. So a lot for us to uh, digest here, but this will be super helpful for everyone to uh, reference in the community. And also too, as you mentioned, some of the, uh, you know, resources as well. So, you know, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time to uh, lead the workshop today. And uh, thanks everyone for the uh, great questions and uh, joining in here.